categories of risk um, that includes the main ones here, which is customer, jurisdiction, product, and channel. Um, you know, usually when you, and unfortunately this is going more back to um, KYC, and this will definitely be in the KYC one if you do the KYC exam, but essentially your, your risk rating is made up of, you know, a bunch of risk ratings towards various categories, you know, client type jurisdiction which is like location you know uh, pro the type of product you know some products are more high risk than others and and the channel in which the, the product is now delivered so you know as an example you know a, a low risk might be uh, a seven-year-old retiree who you know is in the based out of the United States who wants to do something related to the 401k or a, you know a retirement fund and they're using a deposit channel to do that. That's a pretty low risk uh, type of client. You know, maybe more higher risk one might be, you know, uh, uh, someone from Ecuador who, uh, you know, might be like a, you know, a, a dodgy person with no, you know, with no source of funds who is, you know, from Ecuador or any other, you know, higher risk country. And, you know, they're, they're supplying cash and, you know, it's being done through a Casa de Cambio in uh, South Africa. You know, that, that's, that's obviously a higher risk. So it's, it, that, that sort of risk allocation makes the higher risk. And sometimes I worked at a bank that didn't even have, you know, these, these risk allocations correctly. So it's something they're going to try to standardize in the future because I worked at a major, we'll call it, literally we'll call it a, you know, a group, a Wolfsburg Group Bank and uh, one that just recently joined Wolfsburg. And, and honestly, they didn't even have the risk weightings done properly. They were, they were bad. Uh, that's for another story though. Um, you know, obviously it talks about here how you know, the risk can be with the customer can be higher if the customer is a non-resident. That's obviously true. Um, you know, they, can, they can just leave if they're a non-resident, you know, or there's tax issues there as well. Uh, you know, if the legal structure is complex, so it's talking about you know, a lot of sort of uh, channel stuff, a lot of secrecy havens, things like that. You know, it's it's very hard for, you know, com like organizations like the IRS or the ATO in Australia and niche that, you know, they, they, they can't acquire the best talent sometimes. And, you know, people who work in financial crime can pay huge money for top lawyers who are the best talent, you know. And sometimes these these, these, these structures are just so complex, it's, it's, it's just too difficult to work out. That's how they get ahead. So as it talks out here, they are, you know, an industry is exploited for financial crime, or if the customer's business is cash intensive, you won't see too much cash depositing these days. Like, other than like, you know, normal sort of cash depositing type systems, there's, there's they have to do CTRs, you know, currency transaction reports. The old, you know, the good old days of, you know, business just making less money in cash and depositing it, they're kind of over now. You know, you'd be stupid to, to deposit even if you were a financial criminal, you'd be stupid to deposit your cash. You know, into a you know into a bank like that, but you know, up until even recently, they still did it. Um, there are some jurisdictions here are higher risk because of their own laws, regulations, and enforcement controls to prevent financial crime, which are weak and non-existent. Look, that is just huge for a lot of them. You know, um, I kind of you know I, I look, sometimes we joke with my friends. You know, at work, like oh, you know, what's the fin? You know, what's the financial crime setup like in you know the Cayman Islands? Like, who's the you know? who's the financial intelligence unit. It's probably like two guys who meet once a month. <laughs> you know, like this stuff definitely does happen. It's true. Um, talks about the product here. Each product carries a different level of risk. For example, private banking is considered higher risk as transactions may be confidential and an attempt to master true ownership. Yeah, that's even changing though. It's becoming harder for private banking to work the way they did. And, and, and that private banking model that banks used is just not as lucrative as it used to be. So that's why UBS and Credit Suisse, which Switzerland just used to own that private banking model. They're, they're really struggling now, those banks. In fact, you know, UBS and Credit Suisse will definitely merge at some point soon. They have no choice. Uh, channel risk, this is something that's not really discussed with education sort of formats in as much, you know, if you do, obviously, when you do your various training at work. But, you know, it talks about, like, obviously, non-face-to-face -face and face-to-face -face business relationship transactions. And I guess they've added this in here because there's a lot of, you know, online stuff now, you know. Um, like, I recently, read, I recently made a payment to Mexico, you know, that's technically a channel risk because it could be anyone, but they mitigate the channel risk by making me supply my passport. So, you know, there's things like that. Um, you know, uh, customers can be higher risk if they use nominee shareholders, shares in bearer form or company ownership structure, very complex. Look, this is, it, this is A grade, um, 
you know, fantastic original anti-money laundering knowledge. The simple fact is that it's getting very hard for people to even do that. Like most major banks won't accept shares in bearer form. Um, they won't accept nominee shareholders as much anymore. And, and company ownership structure, you know, is, is not as complex as it used to be. You can kind of work it out now, especially with, you know, more KYC side, how they can, you know, they can use maps to sort of, you know, who own, who's the ultimate beneficial owner, et cetera. So um, that's kind of changing, but you might need to know something about one of those things. And they're interesting as well. Um, obviously it talks about tax evasion and money laundering. Tax evasion is not really an issue with us, but money laundering um, and the higher risk that customers who conduct their business relationship with the organization at a geographic distance, which is not explained. You know, for example, a foreign citizen with no connection with a country where an account is being opened requires explanation. Now, unfortunately, and I'm, just, I'm gonna be honest here, um, this is a problem in America. If you live in Europe, if you work in financial crime in, in Europe or Asia, you, you know about countries, but unfortunately, people in America, especially at their sort of education level, they just don't, uh, you know, they don't necessarily know about this stuff. And, you know, I've, I've been through situations, and I know it sounds bad, but I've just, I've been through situations where, you know, a bank has, you know, onboarded a famous war criminal you know, or, you know, famous financial criminal and, you know, their lack of, and, and, and that's been on board within the States because there's just a lack of general knowledge of, of outside of America. Uh, you know, not everyone's like that in America, but there is definitely a general lack of knowledge. And I've seen this happen a few times now. So, you know, that won't be, they have to say this, you know, for the, a lot of the American, you know, I guess American Canadian guys, but in general, no, it's, it's not really something people worry about too much. Um, higher risk jurisdictions are defined as the, by the Financial Action Task Force as countries who have been identified as having strategic deficiencies in their national anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regimes. They pose significant threats to the global financial system. You know, all these countries are reviewed by FATF. Uh, so you can go on the FATF and find out who's good, who's bad. Uh, some are, are compliant, uh, some are not compliant. Uh, and, and there's also a list there that, that shows, you know, countries that are not compliant. So. You know, Iceland was on that recently, so it's not a good list to be on. You know, it's usually when you're on, and I know for a fact that Australia nearly got on there once. So it's 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 you know it's not a list you want to get on. Uh, let's talk about products here. Certain products are higher risk. Um, you know, prepaid device, but this is just standard money laundering. You know, techniques just talking about how the risk they are, uh, and delivery channels are higher risk. Correspondent banking, we all know that creates significant money laundering, terrorism, finance, and risks. Uh, rah, 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 foreign bank, identify the customer, determine the real owners. Yeah, that's just normal anti-money laundering information. Next thing, they're going to talk about this a lot in any AKM situation. They talk about a uh, risk-based approach. So technically, KYC, transaction monitoring, it's, it's a, you work on a risk-based approach. So you are fitting in the risk of the, of, of, of the risk appetite of the organization. So there will be a question on this. You know, um, it's very difficult. We don't, you know, if you work in financial crime, you're never really going to be in the situation where you determine what types of, you know, customers or products the bank accepts. But uh, you'll just sort of mitigate the risk of them in many ways. But um, it's all part of the risk-based approach. You know, allocate the risk rating here. Um, you know, it, it's really a bit confusing sometimes this stuff here because, in general, a lot of banks will just take on anyone except you know people who are illegal. But the key word here is risk-based approach. Um, you know, how much risk are you, are you willing to assume? You know, and they use examples here of the source of funds, can they be corroborated? Unfortunately, a lot of this information is just more AML related, but it's, it's very KYC oriented. It's even really transaction monitoring. And I really do wish that the, 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 tr the CTMA exams did more examples of transaction monitoring, but because each program is individually is, is different and in some ways proprietary, I think they came through a bit scared to go on that route. Anyway. Um, you know, you, if, you, if you do this, you, you'll still be certified and qualified to be a transaction monitor, working transaction monitoring. Uh, products and jurisdictions also present a range of risks. Using risk-based approach allows the organization to effectively use the resources by classifying customers based on a level of perceived risk that it could pose from a financial crime perspective. You know, if you work in this industry for years, you've been reading this stuff for years. Um, uh, you know, you drive the level of frequency and customer research updating the customer profile. So you can see there's a bit of a message here that, that they're trying to like, and ACAMs are trying to be sort of the, the re I wouldn't say regulatory, but they're trying to be like sort of an industry leader in, in the way things are done. But they're sort of trying to push like, hey, keep your customer file up to date and, and all this sort of stuff, risk-based approach and you'll be good. 
Um, it talks about the risk assessment here. That's very KYC, um, but everyone has a risk assessment. Um, actively, ju accurately judging the risk level that a customer might be involved in. Laundering is such an important prerequisite. So this is all about the risk, the risk-based approach here. But you better learn about the risk-based approach because you're going to learn about it anyway, and uh, there will definitely be a question on it. That's for sure. Um, you know, look at this stuff here. Adopting a risk-based approach implies the adoption of risk management process for dealing with money laundering and terrorism financing. This process encompasses recognizing the existence of risks, undertaking an assessment of the risks, and developing control strategies to mitigate and monitor identified risks. This is just AML speak of the highest degree, but it's, you know, the whole industry is like that. <laughs> um, money laundering risk is just one element, money laundering risk. Controlling risk is critical, so this is more audit. You know, to the overall success of the audit. You know, if you work in transaction monitoring, <laughs> you are effectively controlling the risk, but <laughs> on a very low level. But uh, you know, the risk assessments and mitigate and monitor the identified risks. Um, you know, it's talking about control strategies here, policies, procedures, training, four eyes checks. Four eyes checks is good. It means you get someone else to have a look at it. They would def they could legitimately actually. Honestly, there could be a question on that. I did do one. I think the CKYCI CA had a four eyes check question. And segregation of duties. This is uh, segregation of duties is actually very interesting. Uh, I actually quite like it. And there are these fall into this is more, this is more ACAMS talk. The three categories: preventative, detective, and corrective. An internal control framework is a process which organization. It's important to know about this stuff, but you won't be doing this. In, you know, if you work in client onboarding or transaction monitoring or AML, this is an audit situation. Uh, insurance as achieving its objectives in relation to operations, reporting, and compliance. So it talks about it here. Um, the five components of the internal control framework are the overall control environment, risk assessment, control activities, information communication, and monitoring. Uh, the overall control environment is a set of standards, processes, and structures provide the basis for carrying out internal controls across the organization. Unfortunately, since this is kind of like an ACAMS thing, there will be a question on it. Uh, the money laundering risk assessment measures the likelihood, the probability, and the business one willingly engage in money laundering or terrorism financing. The risk assessment identifies inherent risks, the effectiveness of existing controls, and captures the residual risk. Residual risk is something you will get a question on. They talk about this a lot. Uh, I think it's kind of a bit of voodoo magic in some respect, but according to ACAMS, it's the real deal. Um, control activities in financial crime prevention include preventative, detective, corrections. They always talked about this. Uh, preventative controls include robust due diligence, record keeping, and record retention. Uh, record retention is a very big thing with uh, AML, uh, seven years um, in most places. Uh, detective controls include reporting, suspicious activity, and the, to the appropriate authorities. Transaction monitoring is a detective control. Corrective controls include the, the eventual existing, exiting out of the customer relationship when necessary. That's a, that's a decision that uh, the front office usually makes um, with the recommendation of um, financial crime. Uh, information communication include proper employee training, you know, such a big industry, there's proper training for employee. Uh, third party providers and board of directors, regular updates should be given when money laundering typologies evolve. Uh, they do evolve pretty slowly though, but so it's not a big deal. So the frontline staff knows about what to look for. Unfortunately, slash fortunately, slash I don't blame them. You know, if you're working in the front office and you, your, your, your main thing is to make money for the bank, and if you don't make enough money, you could lose your job. Uh, I don't think they really, I don't blame them for not caring about financial crime. And that's something you need to accept. You know, people, whenever you work in this industry, you might deal with the front office and they just don't care. And, and they shouldn't care because they have their own stresses to deal with. And their job is, you know, despite people, maybe back in the 80s it was awesome, but it's not awesome now. It's a lot of hard work and it's not as much money as it used to be. So a lot of pressure and they're not going to care and uh, that's just something you have to deal with. Uh, the final element of risk control is monitoring. This is undertaken by a separate department, such as internal audit. You know, this is the third line of defense they're talking about here or independent insurance within the business of the compliance lines who will test all policies, procedures, and controls that have been properly observed and provided. Okay, this is the residual risk. It's not very quantitative. You're not the CFA here. You're not doing stats, but it's inherent risk versus controlled risk <laughs> equals residual risk. There will definitely be a question on this in the exam, 100%. Uh, financial instance is as close as you get to a quantitative money laundering <laughs> related question, but there will be a question on it, 100%. Make sure you know it. So inherent risk, take away controlled risk. Inherent risk is just risk. Controlled risk is just, you know, how you reduce the risk, and then the, the, the risk left over is the residual risk. Uh, inherent risk, yeah. So th that's what it's basically what it's talking about here. Um, you know, risk channel. You know, channel risk increases with non-face-to-face -face business relationships, transactions, or in payments. That's all about risks here. Um, 
it's talking about you know KYC, customer controls, management approval, it's got here again, as mentioned, so customer's legal structure, it's just talking about risks here, jurisdictions. Risk-based approach to transaction monitoring, yay, more transaction monitoring related stuff, that's better, more specific. In order to meet any money laundering, any obligation, you know, you need to complete a risk assessment, it should be based upon a business model, the products and services offered in the nature of the customer base. A uh, thorough risk assessment will help the organization develop controls that are effective. It provides a baseline to understand risk within the organization and introduce effective controls. Ideally, a risk assessment will be completed annually at a minimum. Uh, I mentioned this earlier about the risk assessments, you know, one year, low risk, no high risk, one year, three years, that's, uh, you know, low risk. Any change or, or any major change that would require a reassessment. Uh, I thought this is talking about transaction monitoring. Anyway, uh, for example, the introduction of a new product channel, customer type, as I just mentioned, procedure to complete the risk assessment is required, and employees must be trained to ensure they understand and complete the risk assessment on a timely and accurate basis. That is a big thing. You have to complete these files on time or people get in trouble, especially in America where, they, you know, someone is always responsible or someone's always at fault. Uh, risk change over time, so an organization will need to keep the risk assessment. Procedures and ensure appropriate risk-based, effective risk management. Um, you know, the organization, um, you know, um, the organization needs to seek out information, threats, trends, this is just all information. Vendors, you know, just a general review of the industry, I don't think there'll be any question. Uh, uh, this is just talking, uh, just talking crap. Really, uh, I wish the risk assessment should be included. Regulators accept that a risk-based approach is applied. They want you. So basically, a lot of this stuff is basically ticking the boxes so they don't get in trouble with regulators. Um, risk-based approach, so that's the process to collect information about the customer. Yeah, it's re they're really talking about the risk-based approach now. Um, <laughs> whether the transactions are in the activity of the organization expected, whether the customer or at least there's some explainable legal level variation. Uh, it's got an example here of an alert. Okay, let's use it because it's a trigger. Example of this due diligence required is a clear alert triggered by a change in the frequency of the deposits into a checking account. So obviously if you have a bunch of money and a bunch of more activity increases, that might create an alert which needs to be mitigated because it could be financial crime. So that's what I was basically saying that as a bank you have to have these programs. Without a risk-based approach, an elderly person in a jurisdiction who recently retired, start with this example, we start to receive monthly pension payment deposits despite it's being subject to the same diligence as a politically exposed person who is part of a foreign government who has made, you know, one-time large deposit of funds. You know, this, this stuff's expensive, so you have to, you know, be in a situation where you, you know, it's, it, the risk-based approach is basically trying, you know, it's hard, it's basically like doing these files as more as efficiently as possible, more, you know, efficiently, cost-effective. Um, KYC does not end after onboarding a customer. Transaction monitoring, that is a big difference between KYC and other and, and transaction monitoring is that KYC effectively, once the, it's done, unless there's a change, it remains the same. Transaction monitoring is ongoing. There might be a question on that because transaction monitoring is just constantly ongoing. Um, to collect information, use for the customer profile, and the customer's risk classification, there is a valuable feedback loop from the transaction monitoring function back to the KYC function. So it keeps talking about how KYC and transaction monitoring are, are connected. They kind of are connected. Um, I guess AKMT is trying to sort of have, they want KYC to sort of, you know, be the kind of main file for the transaction monitoring stuff. Um, depending on the risk profile, the result of clearing alert might lead to a broader review of the customer. Note that customers might not remain in the same risk category throughout their relationship. Uh, they, they do change uh, with the organization. For example, an individual might run for government office if elected. This stuff rarely happens though. Become a politically exposed person that could change the risk classification from low to medium high based on the government role he or she performs and you know also change the way organization generates revenue and alerts to them. 